Done. Okay, we got back to any news Tower of God con uh, cut content. This is episode 4 and 5 cut content. We are actually much ahead right now because this dude's been spoiling the earlier episodes. I think that he made these after watching season 1. So there's some stuff that I shouldn't have known when I was watching in parallel. So we're ahead right now, but we're still going to watch every one of them. Let's see what he has to say. For the first time in our Tower of God cut content series, we actually have full cutscenes to discuss. <gasps> there was a pretty intense fight scene from the third round of the crown game that the anime just didn't include. Not only that, that, but because the anime skimmed on a lot of the action, plenty of details regarding new weapons, techniques, or just the tower in general okay. weren't made clear. Take Kun's speed in the third round, for example. This Why was, was so a direct fast? result of him emptying his bag of the regulars inside. Because he no longer had to carry around the weight of the Yeah, that part, that hand. part. The bag is heavy. Yuhan Sung said that. And the bag getting stuck at the Shinsu wall test. That was the three kids in there, yeah. He was able to move much more quickly. So let's take a look at more things like that and see exactly what was skipped in episode four and five. But first, but first this video is sponsored by Gami Rage! Oh, it's Gamigo. Guys, use your, you know, any news. I don't think the sponsor's even up anymore. But uh, back to the regular content. ...to chapter 21 of the webtoon. Let's start things off at the beginning of the second round. As two new teams entered the arena, Hats found himself up against another swordsman. Yeah, and... It's here that this swordsman mentions a key piece of information about the upper floors. Oh? According to him, swords weren't quite the optimal weapon to use in the tower. Why? If you were planning to climb, then you had to know how to deal with increasingly dense areas of Shinsu. These were high viscosity areas that made it difficult to use swords with high friction surfaces. That's why people use needles. That's what Black March is. That's what Green April also is? I'm not sure. What this meant was that katanas or long swords or basically any sword with a high surface area was practically non-existent in the upper levels. Instead, it was much more common to see needles or spears used. So, this could have been the last time that they got to use their swords in a real fight. What's Hats gonna do? Is he gonna just switch over to Needles then? Because his entire thing is, you know, swordsman. And as much as Hats' opponent wanted to fight fair, gaining the crown was much more important. Now, the anime doesn't quite explain the technique that Hats uses to defend himself. It's a combination it? of offense and defense involving both his swords. The sword with the red hilt is used for the technique Highest Flying Sword. What? Almost always he will start a fight by throwing this sword into the air first. He did throw it up! He'll then have it move on its own to attack or block depending on the situation. I thought it was just a distraction. He threw up in the air so that the enemy is like, what's going on? And then he was like, psych gotcha, but it's more than that. The sword with the blue hilt is used for the technique Lowest Flying Sword. High, Hats low. chooses to wield this one in his hand. And every strike that he makes with it emits a powerful shockwave. Okay. Together they formed a technique that easily defeated the team that he was up against, giving him ample time to save Shibisu and take on Serena's team next. But when Hats saw that Serena and Ho were fighting for their lives... <laughs> Hats, dude, the early Tower of God art is... it's something else. It's something else. I can't draw for shit, but it's something else. As well, Laure slept in the back, you could say that Hats felt a little bit angry. To him, Laure seemed like scum who absolutely didn't deserve to be on the test floor. <laughs> It'd be kind of true, kind of true, but Laure, he's built this. He is constructed uniquely. He can have the special privilege to just nap during all the tests and pass because he's, he's, he's just fucking Laure. He honestly felt that Hedon made a mistake with the selection process. No. Nah. So in order to correct that mistake, Hutz drew his highest flying sword and sent it right over to where Larry slept. Oh? Normally, Hutz was someone who was against killing, but he always made an exception when it came to those he considered scum. And right now, Larry was exactly that. Unless he wanted to die, then he needed to get up now and move. But this was the exact moment that Larry had been waiting for. His plan of isolating Anak all while stalling the round had worked. Now he had the opportunity to target Anak without any third-party interference. That was such a fucking hype scene. Because it, it, it's the same shit like during Quant test with Kun um, basically deceiving everyone. Because Lowry was just fucking sleeping on the ground. No one's expecting anything. And then when he gets up, it is impactful. In the crown game, the bro was like, 
<laughs> gotcha, motherfuckers. And then huge ass Shinsu blast. And then in the Quant Tag game, it's like, what's going to happen? Laura is at the fucking bottom of the elevator, just fucking waiting for the plan. It's just like, oh my God. So like, never underestimate Laura. Never think that he's napping without cause. He's waiting for the perfect fucking time. Unlike in the anime, it looked as if Anak took on the entirety of the second blast. She had visibly taken a decent amount of damage, but not enough to take her out of the fight. While this did make her angry, what was more infuriating was the fact that the trap that she was setting was ruined. You see, Anak was baiting herself in hopes that someone else would challenge her, but instead all she got was Laure. It's only after this that Laure realized that he'd made a terrible mistake. That's so funny how he's dodging around with the fucking sleeping bag. Like, look at him just like, look at this little beanbag thing just like running around, just jumping Laure. around. It's only like, after look here. this that how Laure is he fucking doing that? that he'd made a terrible mistake. Anak had clearly sat herself in the throne for a reason. That much was painfully clear now. So, as everyone looked in awe at Anak's power, Lerido wasn't nearly as impressed. In fact, he was rather disappointed because he was hoping that Anak would remind him of the first time that he met Yuri. Instead, all he saw was the temper tantrum of a spoiled brat. I mean, she is a brat. Then again, who knows how young Yuri was when he first met Leroro though. Even so, the fact remained that the Green April was a very powerful weapon. Upon seeing it- That's right, you can't use ignition weapons, right? There was like a rule. You're like, you're not allowed to fucking ignite Black March or Green April. That's fucking banned. So they're not allowed to use it anymore, right? Unless it's in base form. Couldn't really believe that it was now impossible to win the game. There was just no way that they could possibly go up against an ignition weapon. I ain't gonna lie. How is there such a fucking big difference between Black March and what Black March looks like and this thing, dude? Green April... I'm sorry. I was hoping every one of them would be just like beauties, but like Green April is fucking. What is this thing? It's 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 like a sweaty fucking gross monster looking thing versus you know Black March, who's just a fucking beauty, just like a webtoon beauty. Month series. It's after this ignition that the Black March started to act a bit weird, causing Anak to divert her attention towards Ba. You see, weapons from the 13-month series they resonate. resonate when they're close to each other. Yep. That's how Anak was able to notice the Black March all the way from the throne. Kun was slowly piecing all of this together, but something was still off. Something about Anak having the Green April Sorry. just didn't seem right. Kun always was a perceptive individual, so it's not surprising that he was able to immediately notice the odd nature of Anak's character. Now, after Anak breaks... Basically, what's off is that Anak is, you know, not Anak. Anak is the mom, the real princess, and it's the daughter who took on Green April. ...into Bam's room, there's a line that she says which foreshadows her upcoming development. As Bam refused to hand over the Black March, Anak recalled a phrase that her mom would always say. Chicken pies ready! The ones who fail to know their place die young. And the mom died. Young. How poetic. This is a very significant line considering what happened to Anak's mother. Something that I'm sure you'll realize once you watch episode 6. Again, see? Look at this motherfucker. That's crazy. This is episode 4 or 5 content. I don't think Anak's, you know, fucking past has been told until they meet Endorsey and they talk after this fucking test. This is episode 4 or 5 cut content and you fucking show me about the meaning of the Nisemono, the fake, dude. This is why I'm ahead right now and watching these back in order. Dude, you can't be doing this shit, man. Anak's mother. Something that I'm sure you'll realize once you watch episode 6. Anyway, Lerado had seen enough and he quickly stepped in to break things up. But before Anak left, she didn't just simply make a bet. What she did was request a change to the very rules of the game that they were playing. You see, one of the elements of the tests was that it was possible to change the rules if the test administrator agreed to it. What? So, rather than Anak's proposal just being a simple bet, it turned into an additional game set up within the crown game, all of which was approved by Lerodo. Accepting this game was Bam's safest option. Oh, they're explaining how this crown game even started. As okay. winning meant that he would have guaranteed protection from Anak afterwards. But even with that, Anak still saw Bam's initial hesitation to accept her terms. She believed that it was because Bam had weak teammates, and she was very clear in stating that that's what she thought. Of course, Kun and Rak didn't take being called weak very lightly. 
In fact, it only motivated them to want to prove Anak wrong. So Kun's initial response was that as a main- Kun just looks so fucking different in this hairstyle. He, <laughs> he just straight up looks like a Karen. Bro, if you're gonna have this hairstyle, you can't have these just a clean, like, smooth bangs. You need a jagged or something. Like, he, he looks like he just wants to call the fucking manager right now, man. In character, he was just biding his time, letting all the extras play their games until it was time for his arrival. On the other hand, Rack had something more simple to say. The game without him meant nothing. So, on Bam's behalf, they accepted the game's new rules. This whole affair was getting a little bit exciting now. Even Lidado started to feel that this crown game was shaping up to be the best one in history. I'm just fucking upset that we lost Black Mark. That's some bullshit. Yuri gave that to us. Now we fucking... It's gone. I mean, Anak has it. Are we gonna get it back? I wanna fuck Nick Knight Black March, man. So, with the third round about to begin, here's where things start to get a lot different. As we saw, every team participating knew that getting the crown first was the key to victory. Each team had a member who believed that they could be the fastest. But none could quite keep up with Kun, who got there before anyone was even able to react. And you're telling me this absurd speed that summoned a fucking visible tornado was because he simply put three dudes out of the bag. And the weight difference made him move like that. Really? I thought this was like a movement technique. I understand the bag was heavy, but it was that fucking heavy to the point he could run that fucking fast? It was an inhuman level of speed that actually came from his own power. In the previous tests, Kun wouldn't have been able to move that fast. What is his this movement power? This was because power? he was carrying the weight of more than three people the entire time. Only after he let those people out of his bag was he able to move without constraint. So, yeah, this entire time Kun was carrying around the weight of three people in a single hand. I guess just absurdly fucking fast and strong though, huh? They just, he's just that physically gifted. It's a level of power that was actually very common for all the children of the ten great families. That is kind of spoilers, because I don't think we've said the name 10 Great Families in the show just yet, but I think it's heavily implied, right? Because, like, obviously, Kun's family, right? It's, it's huge. And then there was mentions of, I think, like, Lauri. I, I'm pretty sure he's also, like, part of a great family because he's so fucking built different with the Shinsu. But just like how, you know, different um, imperial systems have the Empire, the Emperor, and, like, the great houses or something. This is like, you have the King Zahad, and then you have the ten great families in which he plucks the daughters from to make them princesses, huh? Anyway, after being the first to retrieve the crown, he then tried to get the other teams to fight each other for it. Although that strategy did in fact work in the anime, it's not really what happened in the webtoon. After throwing the crown, Kun went on to say that only the person who retrieved it would be allowed to fight him for his spot on the throne. It was a level of cockiness that caused the other teams to form an alliance against him. <laughs> in the anime, he looks so cocky. So, like, so, uh, what's the word? Just smooth. In the webtoon art. <laughs> It just makes him look like he rides to short bus home, bro. This does not look cocky. He looks a little fucking special. Rather than fight amongst themselves, they instead decided to cooperate with each other and fight Kun. Only after Kun was dead would they then go for the crown. So, because this agreement wasn't made in the anime, there was a lot less focus on the fights of the third round. In fact, a pretty lengthy fight sequence involving Kun, Kun. Rack and Bum didn't make it to the anime. It started with Katana attempting to attack Kun. Oh, the but big black Kun bob. didn't just simply block this attack. He used his bag to swallow Katan whole and completely remove him from the fight. He got it removed? Was then there that everyone took notice as to just how powerful and potentially expensive Kun's bag was. Yeah, that bag is crazy, the girl bro. Who was always with the knight. She seemed especially interested in the value of it. I have any news has been hinting that this girl in the night is actually super important characters, but so far in the anime, they ain't do shit, but this is kind of interesting. Maybe I should be wary of them as the season concludes. Now, with three teams completely focused on Kun, Rack, and Bum, this whole situation should have been a lot more hectic. We got to see all sorts of Rack weapons and attacks be used on them, and Bum wasn't nearly as safe as the anime made it seem. One person tried to attack him with a gun that shot a remote-controlled marble. He has a gun, but it shoots a remote control to mar- That's your power. That's your fucking special thing. A marble shooter. 
<laughs> like we're playing fucking battle beat em on, bro. Another tried to attack Kun with what's called a compression weapon. These were weapons Gara. where the true size of it was compressed into a smaller form, yeah, it, it all got while huge. keeping the same mass, allowing it to have the same impact as if it was in its full-sized form. Gara took Even us for over someone there. like Kun, it posed quite the threat, so it became something that he needed to avoid. Meanwhile, Rack had just been surrounded on all sides. As he was about to get attacked from three different angles, Doesn't Kun matter. positioned himself in a way that directed his enemy strike towards another. This caused Alexei to get hit by the full force of the compression. Oh! Kun wasn't yet in the clear though. He was still fighting against Palgia, a wielder of a longer katana type sword. Because Kun had only ever pulled out a small knife, Palgian felt that he had a range advantage. This left him for Kun to strike with a longer version of his knife, taking out the last of We have a longer version of Have we seen that? Hold the fuck up! I don't remember this. Maybe it was longer and I was too, you know, focused on the episode. Just to, to hide the fights going on, but like... Okay, we have a small knife and a long knife? The close range fighters. However, many of the ranged ones were still planning their attack. The Shinsu user, sniper, and compression weapon holder all felt that bomb was the easiest. Sniper? Who the f There was an actual fucking sniper? That little girl. That's not Grey though. No, no, no. Grey's a Shinsu controller, right? Who the fuck is this sniper? Target. So, as they all launched an attack aimed directly at Bao, what the fuck? Actual guns? That, that's so interesting. This world of like. Like, like, like. Technology. And, like, for example, in Reincarnate as a Slime, seeing a gun in the show is like, hold the fuck up. This should not be here. They don't have this kind of technology. So, a gun is clearly brought in by an Isekai character, right? But in Tower of God, it just seems like it's very futuristic while having these like old medieval time kind of themes too sometimes where you can't have computers and high tech shit and then there's also people just fighting with katanas and shit, right? So the gun that exists, it's, it's not that special. It's like the technology here, it, it, it does make sense. Every single one of them, including the bullet that was about to hit him, stopped completely. From an outsider's perspective, it's almost as if some mysterious force was protecting Bum. Shinsu? Whatever it was, the fact that their opponents were now in a frozen state What do you mean? The bullet didn't pass. There was something more than meets the eye here. All the attacks here- Aimed directly at Bam, something weird happened midway. Every single one of them, including the bullet that was about to hit him, stopped completely. Not even the bullet, everyone stopped. Leroro? You handsome? Bam's inner tail of the beast? I don't fucking know. Black March? No. I don't know what this is about. From an outsider's perspective, it's almost as if some mysterious force was protecting Bum. Whatever it was, the fact that their opponents were now in a frozen state gave Kun and Rak the opportunity to take them out. This left only Chung Chung. She was trying to use her small size to destroy oh, the, the crown and make her way to the throne. The one that jumps but side. That's when Kun revealed that the crown was just a fake. His Psych. plan of using the fake crown to turn the enemy's attention away from Bum was a complete success. Of all the different items that we've seen in Power of God, I may want this bag more than Black March. Maybe that's a crazy thing to say. Black March is sick. Ignition weapon, immensely powerful. But it's just powerful. This bag's utility, how durable, how flexible, it's so, it's just so convenient. This bag might be the best fucking item that we've seen so far. Sure, it came with the help of some mysterious force, but really all that mattered was the outcome. Now, the fourth round ended just as quickly as the third, as Kun had used the team that he snuck in with to help him win. If you remember last cut content, when Kun went to the bathroom, that was the moment that he used to take the other three regulars out of his bag. Okay. So now we bring ourselves to the final round. Four teams entered, but as soon as the round started, only two of them were left standing. The mysterious masked woman took all of them out. <laughs> the gym she suit. then easily evaded Rack and went straight for Bam. So like, why did she wear this though? Cause like, after the crown game, red hair girl, she's in regular clothing now, right? Like, 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 why is she still not in the game suit? Like, she could put that shit back on, but she just, like, you know, revealed her, she hasn't revealed her identity, but she's shown us what her face looks like. He's also got a very interesting eye thing, I don't know. And this girl is so interesting because she went for Rachel instead of, you know, uh, Pom there. She went, it's like, 
her mission was almost like kill Rachel rather than take the crown. That's what's so weird about this. Kun was unable to react because he was busy dealing with another regular. So the woman was able to confront Bam uncontested. But rather than forcibly take the crown from the beginning, for some reason she first requested that he hand it over. Hmm. This gave Endorsi enough time to intervene. But not with her needle though. Instead she fought with what's known as her lapel pins. Lapel pin? Endorsi got new weapons that I've never seen before. Lapel pins. These were weapons that she wore on her dress that could expand what? and compress. And then, what the fuck? Why did they not show this? In this case, she expanded them into shields that would protect Bob. And she would continue to use them in combination with these tiny needle-like projectiles. What the fuck? Not she had once did she have to bring out her real needle. And Dorsey fought this mysterious challenger without ever needing to go on the offensive. She looked as if she was simply playing, evading every attack as if they were coming from a child. She overwhelmed Gimp Suit Red Hair Girl. Really? The anime did her dirty because it looked like it was kind of close and then her heel broke and then, you know, she got dusted after that. On the other hand, Kun and Rack weren't having such an easy time. Lucky for them, they had the outsider team to help. So as Anak watched the situation unfold, she began to worry that things might actually go against how she expected. You see, she made the bet with Bam believing that the outsider team would win the game in the fifth round. There was no way that they heard about the additional rule that Lidodo added. And there was no logical reason for them not to win the game. So for them to come in and do the exact opposite of what Anak planned, well, that was a bit frustrating for her. Meanwhile, Outplayed. this whole time, Bam was wondering whether the girl standing in front of him was actually Rachel or not. Nah, it's not Rahel, it's Mihel Light. But to him, something about her teaming up with this giant monster just didn't seem right. I know the giant monster looks scary because, you know, in this first round, they killed everybody. But in one of the future episodes, Rack and him are just eating chocolates because they both passed the test and they're having a fun contest. Really made him seem more, you know, less of like a brutal fucking murderer. I would like to know what his real personality is like. He could never imagine a situation where Rachel would befriend this thing. So perhaps it wasn't Rachel at all. It was that- Or- You've only seen one side of Rachel that she wanted to show you, and you don't know who the real Rachel is. Lingering doubt that kept him playing the game at all. Because he wasn't 100% sure that this girl was in fact Rachel, then he couldn't intentionally lose the game just yet. But if she was, then this game was pointless. So when Rachel's identity was finally revealed, that was the point where the game didn't matter anymore. Right now, the only thing that mattered was to protect Rachel. I hate this. I fucking hate how he just keeps chasing after this girl that doesn't give a fuck about him. But that's the core of, you know, focus of the story. It's here that Bam would do something that would shock even the administrator. What was this? Shinsu. Not a single person knew what Gold happened. Shinsu. The only thing that everyone saw was a single blast of Shinsu. What is that? The thing is, this Shinsu didn't move as if it was being manipulated. No, it looked more as if it moved of its own volition. It had a mind of its own. It was not being manipulated by Bomb. It's also the color of gold. They also mention in the meeting between Leroro and Yuhan Song that normally if you don't have a contract with the floor admin, you cannot use Shinsu. But he could. Irregular. But beyond that, why? Almost as if it was protecting Bomb. Whatever it was, it went against the very laws of the tower. Now, Bomb didn't get up after this. He doesn't lose control and the Black March doesn't put him to sleep. All that was what? just original stuff that was added to the anime. What? This never happened in the webtoon? They, they basically just wanted to show Black March one more time. They're like, yeah, people love it when Black March shows us. So it's like, fuck it, let's just, let's just put her in. Instead, we skip to a scene with Yuri. Huh. And again, we find a lot of the stuff involving her and her team to be cut out. The scene begins with her complaining to Evan about how it was taking way too long to get to Evan Kell's floor. What started out as two roads shifted to three and now became five. The path was just getting longer. Come on, navigator. She felt that she needed a light bearer now more than ever. Anyway. She doesn't have a light bearer? Why? Yuri had gathered so many rankers that it looked as if she was getting ready to go to war with Evankel. I mean, that's what Kurudan actually thought was going on. Kurudan. And this guy, the jacket symbol in that episode reaction I mentioned, it looks like the same tattoo that Urek Mazino has and I was wondering like is that 
meaningful. Apparently the anime, the design of it was really bad and it was actually the same mark on his back. But according to Evan, Evan Kell's rank was so high that even the idea of opposing her was foolish. Her! Evan Kell's a girl! Ice Strawberry and her partner come back from scouting the paths. Mrs. Ice Strawberry? Who the fuck are these characters? They must be so OP. Yeah, this mark as well. Look, look, look! This guy, this is the same mark. The feathers, right? Multiple feathers that stems like a tree. That was on Uregma. That's his tattoo, right? She mentioned how the third road looked the fastest. But unfortunately, part of the path was a white steel eel nesting ground. Normally, a group of eels wouldn't be a problem to take care of. But when they're nesting, they choose to place their babies in areas of highly dense Shinsu. This was in order to protect them from other animals. Only people or creatures with steel-like armor would be capable of surviving that pressure of Shinsu. Even top rankers like the ones in Yuri's team would find their movements heavily restricted. Really? At first, Yuri didn't believe it. Bob but could move. Then bet his wing tree badge that no person would be able to move freely in that level of Shinsu. I saw an unknown kid running through the Shinsu recently. What the fuck is he talking about? Does that matter? Do we know? Is he mentioning Bomb? I don't know. So this was quite the bold statement. Oh, that's Yuri's Typically, line? The Never wing mind. tree badge indicated that the wearer was- Wing tree badge indicated that the wearer was? Do I want him to finish the sentence? Should we listen to it? it it's, it's not really a spoiler. I just want to know what the meaning of it is because it's on Urek Mazino's back. My guess is like, this is like Urek's like guild, like his group. Like if you have this symbol, you are one of the boys that Urek has like deemed like worthy and you're part of our gang. Not necessarily all irregulars, but like people that he would be fine letting into his like party or side. One of the strongest people in the tower. So okay. for someone like that to say that a task was too hard, then... Basically, one of the strongest people people in the tower. There's no real meaning behind it, but clearly it's Urek's group. He has a fucking tattoo on his back, and if you're in this, you rock this symbol, you are, like, highest, like, strongest people in the tower. This, this symbol is actually so cool. Multiple wings. It almost reminds me of, like, the fallen angel wings in high school DxD. You know how, like, Azazel and them, they have black, you know, wings, but it's got multiple wings like this, while the angels have, like, a single pair of wings? It must be true. But even then... Yuri still had her doubts. I mean, she herself was naturally highly resistant to the flow of Shinsu, so very rarely had she ever experienced any kind of resistance with it. Not only that, but she was confident that she knew of a person who could very easily traverse that path. Bam! Someone they were going to meet on Evan Kell's floor. So, with all that said, the- Not Bam. Not Bam at all. No, this is someone else. Yuri mentioned them, but there's someone else he keeps mentioning right now. The only other path available was down the fifth road. This guy's Which gaming. brings us now to the end of the crown game and a little bit extra. As I'm sure you noticed, there was plenty of stuff to talk about this time, and there will definitely be even more next episode. Great! So, be sure to come back next week where we'll continue with episodes 6 and 7. And I just hope he doesn't fucking spoil us, but it's gonna happen, that's why I am prepared to watch further ahead, and you guys don't have any idea on YouTube, because you motherfuckers are so behind, but please, go like, Mr. Anis' you know, content, like his video and if you enjoyed it, but we'll be on to the next one very soon.